the shedding of your blood, not just any blood. Uh, there can be no remission nor removal of sin. And so God, we stand here pardoned by the grace of God for the shed blood of Jesus. Uh, and for that, we give you praise. Your word says, let the redeemed and the blood bought of the Lord uh, not be ashamed and say so. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it, and it alone has the power to save. And Charles Spurgeon says that the Bible is a very bloody book because it talks about the Passover in the Old Testament, which culminates in the shed blood of the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so we're thankful simply for the blood and for the book that lets us know that the blood will never lose its power. God, we stand here now to proclaim a living Savior who is in the world today. Praying that someone by his wonderful blood might come into a new relationship with you on today. Father, we thank you, we praise you, uh, we honor you, uh, we acknowledge your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is certainly good.
As a matter of fact, you'll find that when that metaphor is used, more often than not, it connotes the idea uh, literally and symbolically of a ship that is traveling from one port to another. Paul, in this lesson, would want us to understand something through his simple voyage in life, something about our voyage in life, and help us to know that, listen, all of us who are children of God need to understand that God has a certain destination for all of our lives from birth to the grave. As a matter of fact, God has that destination, and when we deviate, we will all find ourselves shipwrecked. As we look at the voyage of life, just like a ship, we'll see that in our life we often become distracted by the episodes of life. And when I say distracted, listen, as life is going on, listen, smooth sailing would not mess with any of us. Amen. But as soon as something comes into our life that seems to be a storm, a dark cloud, or something that makes us want to go off course, we get all messed up and we start trying to do things in our own way. Somebody talk to me here today. Uh, that's what Paul uh, has going on right here with those who are around him. Listen, the passing circumstances and shifting circumstances will often cause us to eclipse the final destination from our view. Listen, understand that God has given all of us a view of the final destination. But passing circumstances and situations that shift and turn on a dime will make us take our eyes off what God has put in front of us. That's why the writer of Hebrews said, let us lay aside every weight. A weight is a distraction. And every sin that will so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that will be set before us. Not focused on the circumstances of life, but looking unto Jesus. Who is the author and finisher of our faith. Listen, changes and chances. Disappointments and vicissitudes, distractions and disturbances will arise out of nowhere. And they will often leave us with things that are unexpected. Many of us find ourselves at a point even today where we have to deal with events that we did not plan for, nor are we ready for. The fact of the matter is, in the context of Paul's writings, my brothers and sisters, is that storms are part of life. And if we trust God, we'll be saved. But if we focus on the tempest, we will be destroyed. This is the idea of being overtaken by life's storms. It's something that Paul wants us to understand. In our text, there was a great storm that arose on the Mediterranean Sea that overtook the ship that Paul was traveling on to get to Rome. It was, my brothers and sisters, a literal storm, but also symbolic of the storms that come into the lives of God's people. Now, the fact of the matter is, you need to understand that Paul was traveling from Jerusalem to Rome because it was all in God's plan. As a matter of fact, you might want to ask yourself, why is it that Paul wanted to go to Rome? Well, you got to go back and read Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, Paul begins to pray and thank the Romans for the grace of God. But there in verse 9, 10, and 11, Paul tells the Romans by way of correspondence. He says, listen, I've got a desire to come to you. And I want you to pray that before I leave this earth, that I might be able to come to you. The fact of the matter is, it's, it's troubling that Paul would want to go to Rome. But Paul knew that the Romans needed the gospel. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 9, 10, and 11, Paul says, I need to come to Rome. Many want to know why I want to go to Rome when there are other places like Athens that are more destination spots. Paul says, the reason I want to go to Rome, because in Rome, y'all got things twisted and mixed up. He says in Romans chapter 1, you got women want to be with women, men want to be with men. I got the thing all mixed up, and I got to come to Rome to bring the gospel. I'm just trying to give you the context of why Paul said, I got to come to Rome. Matter of fact, the historian Seneca said that Rome was a cesspool of iniquity. Juvenal said that Rome was a filthy sewer. The apostle John on the island of Patmos said that Rome was a persecuting monster and the abomination of the earth. Paul said in Romans 1 that Rome is a 
moral decadence. Yeah. And if ever there's a place that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ, oh, it's Rome. So Paul says, I got to get to Rome. But I want you to understand something. Rome, Paul did not win a carnival cruise trip to Rome. He didn't. He didn't win a competition. As a matter of fact, uh, if you read Acts chapter 26, he was standing before King Agrippa. And all through the book of Acts, Paul was being beaten and imprisoned because he would not stop yeah. preaching the gospel. Paul said, I don't care what you do. You can whip me with 39 lashes. You can drown me. You can kill me. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So in Acts 26, he's preaching the gospel. They brought him to call for King Agrippa. King Agrippa said, Paul, you're very convincing. I'm almost about to become a Christian myself, but I can't go that far. So King Agrippa said, but since you keep defying what we tell you to do, I'm going to lock you up, put you in chains, we're going to put you on a boat, and take you to Rome. I'm not going to make it I'm trying to tie all the Bible together. Paul would not stop preaching the gospel. He went to Rome in change. Yeah, yeah. But listen, Paul said there's something else I got to do. Before I got to Rome, I got to go to Jerusalem. So you can put me in change. Yeah. But I got to be on a boat that goes to Jerusalem first as a prisoner. They said, Paul, why do you got to go to Jerusalem first? Well, there was a Macedonian call that came out. Yeah. In the middle of the book of Acts. That there are some Jerusalem believers who have been there since the day of Pentecost. All right. They don't have no food. They don't have no money. Paul says, I sent a letter out to all the other churches. In 1 Corinthians 16, y'all collect some money. I got to come get the money and drop it off in Jerusalem. Y'all not going to pray with me here today. Paul dropped the money off in Jerusalem. Got on another boat. They headed towards Rome. Paul, it says in Acts 27, there was a centurion soldier that was assigned to him. But that centurion soldier took a liking to Paul. And when they got on the boat, it says, in their destination, it literally says, there was contrary wind after contrary wind that kept coming after the boat. Paul said, y'all don't need to go that way, you need to stop. Those who were sailors didn't want to listen to a prisoner. They kept on going. Amen. Kept going in the contrary wind. Yes. Finally, it says in verse 8, they came to a place that is called Fair Haven. Mm. Now, many of us would think, you know the term Fair Haven? Yes. It really sounds like a place you want to yes. go. Yes. So when they got to Fair Haven, listen, they had gotten messed up by, by, by the Chamber of Commerce of Fair Haven. Uh -huh. Because the Chamber of Commerce of Fair Haven said, this is a good place to stop. But when they got to Fair Haven, they realized that ain't the place you want to be when a storm is coming. Paul said, I know Fair Havens ain't the ideal place, but if you keep on going, it's going to get worse. They didn't listen to Paul. They said, we're going to keep going until we get to a place called Phoenix. They kept trying to go to Phoenix. When they got to Phoenix, it was worse than it was in fair haven. How many times in our life has God said, stay right where you are? And you say, God, right where I am ain't good. But when you deviate from God's plan, you'll find that going another place is going to be worse than you are right now. Somebody talk to me. They moved on to Phoenix and they found out that the wind was contrary. Now what we see in verse 15, Paul tells them, he says, listen, the ship, listen, was caught in the wind. And when they could not stand up to wind, this is what they did. They gave way and they allowed themselves to simply drift and be driven along. That's what happens to many of us. Amen. When we deviate from God's plan and it gets too rough, we just start drifting away from church. Drifting away from prior, prior practice. Drifting away from Bible study. We just start drifting away and giving in to the wind. But listen, Drifting lives like drifting ships can be aimless. When you are drifting, you are existing in an aimless condition. Drifting lives like drifting ships can be in jeopardy, my brothers and my sisters. A whole lot of folk like this ship drifted away from what Paul and God wanted, and they found themselves in jeopardy. But where I want to part 
is for us to understand that drifting lives, like drifting ships, can be rescued. Amen. Listen, you may have been drifting aimlessly. You may be drifting and be in jeopardy. But if you've been drifting, you can be rescued and saved. Amen. Paul gives us a formula how we can be saved from drifting. Uh, first of all, we got to give up some stuff. We got to give up our own way. It says in the text that when the ship got in trouble, they said, listen, Paul, we don't want to die. We didn't listen to you. But, but let us grab some of the cargo and let us throw it overboard. It's amazing when you get into a rough storm, some stuff that you thought was really important, Amen. you don't mind Amen. throwing it overboard Amen. if it's going to save your life. Amen. But let me show you something, how we do God, because many of us like to bargain with God. Amen. And when God gets us into a stormy situation, what we initially give up is not really what's most important to us. It's just a little something, something that we want to give as a token to God if you will get us out of here. So what they did was they jettisoned some cargo that they really could do without somebody talk to me. But it didn't get no better. So then they came back and they said, let us throw some more stuff overboard. They threw the grain overboard. Now listen, in the Mediterranean world, grain, it was a valuable commodity. But it wasn't the most valuable commodity. So they threw over the cargo, threw over the grain, but then it still didn't get better. God said, y'all playing with me. Y'all want me to deliver y'all so y'all can get delivered and go right back doing what y'all did before. Somebody talk to me. That's what we do. So finally it kept getting worse. And finally they took the most valuable commodity, the wheat. They threw the wheat overboard. God said, now they finally got it. Listen, many folk are near the kingdom but lost. Like that rich young room. Because we're willing to give up a little something that ain't really important to us. But God says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole wide world and lose his soul? But understand, when you get rescued, God's sovereign power is always in control. Because what we need to understand is there's something different between human relief, which is temporary, and God's relief, which is permanent. Amen. They had been depending on their own anchors to deliver them. But God said, until you depend on the ultimate anchor, with anchor, which is me, you shall not be delivered. Finally, they were dependent on the ultimate anchor, which is God. Amen. But yet the ship ran aground. And when the ship ran aground, the ship broke into pieces. And when the ship broke into pieces, from a human standpoint, it went from bad to worse. But it was at that point when they totally surrendered to God that we see the divine purpose of God taking place. The Bible says that when the broken pieces fell in the water, Paul said, I want those who can swim to jump in the water first and those who cannot swim to grab hold to the broken pieces Amen. so that you can get safely to shore. Amen. Now you need to notice in the latter part of Acts 27 that the soldiers under the centurion said, listen centurion, we know you are in command, but we need to kill Paul and these soldiers because if we get to Rome without the prisoners, the emperor is going to kill us. The soldier said, the ship has run around. The prisoners have broke camp. We better kill them. But the centurion, who had been observing Paul, said, you know something? I, I, I kind of like this Paul. Matter of fact, I kind of like the God that he trusts in. And I really believe the God he trusts in is the reason why ain't none of us going to die. So we're not going to kill Paul. All of a sudden, the wind that was blowing in their face. When they jumped in the water, those who could swim, and those who jumped in who couldn't swim got on broken pieces. The wind that was blowing in their face took another direction and started blowing from behind them and blew them directly to shore. Somebody missed this. When you get in line with God, God will do some stuff that will get you to your destiny. today. 
blood of God, my brothers and sisters, still works. Yeah. Paul yeah. wants us to understand that the voyage of life will be filled with many episodes. But when we trust God, yeah. we'll find that our destination and our landing in port shall be secure. Yeah. As we open the doors of the church and extend the invitation yeah. to membership in the kingdom of God and membership in the local church, Invite those, my brothers and my sisters, who stand in need of being rescued by the blood or being saved. Come and become a member of the family of God by confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, shall be saved. If you're already redeemed and already on the old ship of Zion, that ark of safety, the need of church membership, we invite you to come and become a member of this local church. Please understand, being a member of the local church does not save or redeem. Amen. It's being a member of the kingdom and the family of God, first and foremost. Amen. So I ask you to stand. We invite you to come.